Maureen at Church Van Al. Good morning and welcome to our online Sunday service on today, the 2nd of October. Now, I am going to guess that most of you are in your living rooms right now. Am I right? Yeah, not too bad, eh? Uh, you'll know that our auditorium is being refurbished at the moment. So for today and for next Sunday, the 9th of October, we will be online only. So uh, I hope you enjoy church at home and invite some people around. That would be awesome. Um, I hope that the school holidays have started well for those who have got kids. Uh, I know we're only into what? What is this? Day two? But uh, hopefully it's going well. Um, this week that's just been... Uh, the youth worker team hosted an end of term morning tea for the staff and teachers and support uh, at Long Bay College. And it was a really good morning that we, we had. And so I just want to say thank you very, very much to all of those who baked wonderful treats, who provided supplies, who prayed and just uh, supported us because it is a team effort to, to bless the, the, the school. And we just are so appreciative for all the help. So Thank you so much. Um, one of the, the staff at the college uh, commented on how much uh, she thinks Long Bay Baptist is a wonderful church that does incredible things. And I said that I would mention that too to you. So um, that's pretty awesome to hear. Now, today we are starting a new series looking at the first letter to the Thessalonica church that Paul wrote. And interestingly enough, this was the very first letter that Paul wrote. So of all the letters he wrote, this was number one. So we're going to get into that soon. James is going to kick us off with the first message, and next week I'll preach uh, the second one. Um, before we do, though, I wondered if you knew that the week that we've just had, finishing today, it was Mental Health Awareness Week. And now this is a great week where it's just a chance to check in with yourself, but also with other people around you and just see how you're doing mentally and emotionally. Um, the focus for this year has been about reconnection, uh, reconnecting with ourselves to others and to land as well. And so um, I just came across this proverb that I'd like to read. Ma te whakarongo ka mohoyo, ma te mohoyo ka marama, ma te marama ka mato, ma te mato ka ora. Translation, through listening comes knowledge. Through knowledge comes understanding. Through understanding comes wisdom. And through wisdom comes well-being. Now, well-being is a term that uh, is often talked about now, about looking after yourself holistically. And it's so important that we do that. Um, for me, I, you know, I've had my fair share of mental health challenges over the years. And so um, I think it's important that we do things to keep ourselves well. Um, that's regular exercise, that's checking in on friends, that's uh, asking for help if needed. And I think one of the areas where a lot of us struggle are with the thoughts that we have in our minds. Um, sometimes these can be very debilitating and sometimes we can have a thought that just gets stuck and goes around and around and around. Um, now, I've been reading this book by Pastor Louis Giglio called Don't Give the Enemy a Seat at Your Table. And it's such a good book, especially if you struggle uh, in, your, in your mind with thoughts that uh, you can't get out. And so uh, in this, he talks about how um, as believers in, in Jesus, we can have this even though I will kind of faith, even though bad things might happen, even though I might be struggling, even though I've lost my job, even though this is happening to me or to my loved ones, even though dot, 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 you put what you want in there, I will have faith in God. I will believe that he has my best interests at heart. I will carry on. Um, I will place my trust in him. And I just love this because we know what those even those are, right? And we can get stuck in those circumstances in our mind as well. But the I will is that we have our faith in Jesus. And so with that, I want to read Psalm 121 to you. It's a declaration of faith and it's a promise as well. Um, this is part of the Psalm, the psalm of Ascents that um, the group of songs that the Jewish uh, pilgrims of the day, they would travel to worship uh, in the temple in Jerusalem. And as they go, they would sing these psalms. It was um, Psalm 120 to 134. 
And so Psalm 121 says this, and you'll, you'll probably be familiar with this. I look up to the mountains. Does my help come from there? My help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. He will not let you stumble. The one who watches over you will not slumber. Indeed, he who watches over Israel will never slumber nor sleep. The Lord himself watches over you. That's right. He watches over you. The Lord stands beside you as your protective shade. The sun will not harm you by day, nor the moon at night. The Lord keeps you from all harm and watches over your life. The Lord keeps watch over you as you come and go now and forever. Isn't that good? I just love that because, you know, it says my help doesn't come from anything that I can do, any circumstances that I'm at, anything that I can wish to happen in my life. My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth, who watches over my life, who watches over your life, and who will go before you in everything and protect you and be there for you because he is faithful. So let's worship the Lord of heaven and earth now together. Let's pray. Father, we just thank you that you do watch over us in our lives. Thank you that you do have good plans for us. Thank you that you are faithful. Thank you that even though things happen in our lives, even though things happen in the lives of those who we love and is suffering, we will trust in you. We will rely on you. We will put our faith in you because you are good and you are faithful and you are true. And we worship you today. In Jesus' name, amen. How deep the Father's love for us. How vast beyond all measure that he should give his only son to make a wretch his treasure how great the pain of searing loss the father turns his face away as wounds which mar the chosen one bring many sons to glory On his shoulders A shame I hear my mocking voice Call out among the scoffers It was my sin that held him there Until it was accomplished His dying breath has brought me boast in anything no gifts no power no wisdom but I will boast in Jesus Christ his death and resurrection why should I gain from his reward I cannot give in but this I know with all my heart His wounds have paid my ransom But this I know with all my heart His wounds have paid my ransom But this I know with all my heart his wounds have paid my ransom
Hello Church family, welcome back to another one of our online Sundays. We do that of course because our auditorium is currently being refurbished and so this Sunday, Sunday the 2nd of October and of course Sunday the 9th of October will be online only but then we'll be back in person on the 16th of October. Today we start a new series, it's going to be from the book of 1 Thessalonians and to start the series we're going to start rather predictably in 1 Thessalonians Chapter 1, reading from verse 1. Let's do that together. Paul, Silas, and Timothy, to the church of the Thessalonians, in God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, grace and peace to you. We always thank God for all of you and continually mention you in our prayers. We remember before our God and Father your work produced by faith, your labour prompted by love, and your endurance inspired by the hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. For we know, brothers and sisters, loved by God, that he has chosen you, because our gospel came to you not simply with words, but also with power, with the Holy Spirit and deep conviction. You know how we lived among you for your sake. You became imitators of us and of the Lord, for you welcomed the message in the midst of severe suffering with the joy given by the Holy Spirit. And so, you became a model to all believers in Macedonia and Achaia. The Lord's message rang out from you, not only in Macedonia and Achaia. Your faith in God has become known everywhere. Therefore, we do not need to say anything about it, for they themselves report what kind of reception you gave us. They tell how you turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God, and to wait for his Son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, Jesus, who rescues us. From the coming wrath. Now this city in Thessalonica was a key place. Uh, one commentator um, speaks about the the ideal location that the city finds itself in. It was on the Via Ignatia. It was a, a trade route where people from east and west would come. It was the road that would take the east all the way through to Rome. Trade flowed across these regions and things got shared. Uh, goods and spices and cuisine and language and in amongst that, religion. And if Christianity could get a hold in a place like Thessalonica, then it could impact the whole world, that it would travel um, with these people down these trade routes, and who knows what impact might be had. So, a strategic location, but was that Paul's reason for actually going there? One thinking could say, yes, absolutely, that's what it was. Well, it might be true, and if it is, I don't believe it would be the primary reason why Paul went there. The truth be told, it wasn't on Paul's radar. He wanted to go to Asia, but couldn't. He wanted to go to Bithynia, but couldn't. And then there was a dream and uh, from a man from Macedonia, say, Coming, uh, come over to us. And so they packed their bags, arrived at Philippi, and a short while later, arrived here at Thessalonica. And I'm not saying that Paul didn't see the importance of the city. I'm just saying that maybe it wasn't his primary thing looking around the whole world. You see, Paul tended to deal with the people who were right in front of him. When we were at college, one of the things that we were reminded of was about people who are right in front of you. It can be something really small, like when you're chatting to someone after church, don't keep peering over their shoulder to see who might be behind them, sighing and looking at your watch and things like that. You give the people who are in front of you your attention. And that seems to me what Paul was doing here, that he was giving the people in front of him his attention. We've got a testimony that's coming up. and It's told by Karen. It's a testimony of her and, of course, her dad. Now, in this testimony, you will hear about how her dad was delivered from some of the addictions that he had in his life, and it was a miracle. We recognize also that for some people who struggle with addictions of various sorts, that it can be a long journey, that there are many levers that need to be pulled in order to help people through that journey. And as a, as a local church here, we'd be happy to walk with you as you journey from the place of addiction to a place of freedom. And we know that that can be a long journey for some, it can be a really quick journey for others, but either way, we'd be happy to go on that with you. But for now, Listen to the story of Karen and her dad. Good morning, church. Today, James has asked me to give you my dad's testimony. To understand how my dad came to know Jesus, it's important you know a little bit of the background. My dad was in a terrible car accident. 
He and my uncle were driving down an open road when a truck pulled out in front of them. My uncle tried to swerve and go around the truck, which meant that the passenger side where my dad was sitting went under the front wheel of the truck. My dad's injuries were extensive and awful, which meant a very long road to recovery. In fact, he was in hospital for two years where he had to learn to walk again and to function again. Um, as often happens um, with people who have had a lot of injuries, they become addicted to the painkillers they're on, which is what happened to my dad. He also was addicted to alcohol. And again, in situations like that with addiction, there's a lot of mood swings, a lot of bad temper, a lot of aggression. And it was really difficult to communicate with my dad and talk to him about anything. But I did talk to him about Jesus. I did speak to him about the importance of giving his life to Jesus. And he did listen, but he didn't do anything about it. Still, his, um, his go-to was alcohol and pain relief. Um, about four or five years after the car accident, he was once again in hospital. But this time he was in hospital because of alcohol poisoning. I was really upset um, when I heard what he'd done to himself through through this abuse of, of these um, addictions. And I cried out to the Lord and the Lord was so faithful. He gave me so many scriptures um, for my dad to read. And I wrote all of these scriptures down, marked where they were in the Bible, picked up my Bible and my little 18 month old son and went off to the hospital to go and visit my dad. Um, my dad's face lit up when he saw us come into, into the ward because he was happy to see me and his little grandson. And I said to him, Dad, what are you doing here? And he said, well, Karen, you need to understand life is very hard. And I just said, stop, Dad. I actually don't want to hear this anymore. I don't want to hear you put yourself in hospital here through your addictions. You need Jesus as your Lord and Savior. Here is my Bible. Here are these scriptures that I've marked for you to read. Read them. And tomorrow I will come back to the hospital and we'll talk again. And I tootled out. Driving home, I felt so disrespectful because I had been quite rude and quite short with my dad. Um, and I was a little bit wor worried about that. But um, the next day, I, true to my word, I went to the hospital, walked into the ward. And again, his face lit up when he saw us walk in. But there was a different light in his eyes. And I said to him, Dad, how are you feeling today? And he said, you were right. I've read everything that you marked for me. I needed Jesus. And he said, last night, I prayed and asked the Lord Jesus to come into my life and be my savior. And from that minute onwards, the Lord faithfully delivered him from his addiction to alcohol and pain relief. It was so well overwhelming for my dad to be set free from these addictions that he decided to dedicate his life to Jesus um, by helping others who, who suffered from addictions. The first thing he did was he went to the Salvation Army and explained he wanted to help um, people on the streets who were addicted. Did they need his help? And they said, yes, please. And for a long time, he worked with people um, through the Salvation Army with addictions. Then um, he moved to a, a house called the Bread of Life. This is a, a home in Harare, which is a wonderful ministry and um, that helps people with addictions. It is not sponsored by a church. It's totally funded on faith. Um, and uh, the Christians that work for the Bread of Life go onto the streets at night. Um, they find the, the homeless who are there because of addictions. They talk to them about Jesus. If they're willing, they take them back to the Bread of Life where they stay with them, work with them. Um, rehabilitate them, but more importantly, lead them to Jesus. Um, and my dad worked through the Bread of Life for many years, with the Bread of Life for many years. 
And while he was at Bread of Life, he also um, started going uh, studying at Bible College to be a pastor. And uh, I, it was so amazing. I would go to listen to him on Sundays when he preached, and I couldn't believe it that this was my dad up in the pulpit there, um, talking to others about the wonders of Jesus and the beauty of the Bible. Um, but there he was. Um, and then, unfortunately, he developed um, colon cancer, and it was quite um, far advanced um, before it was discovered. So he did not recover um, from this. Um, and he never stopped trusting in, in the Lord for his healing, but he didn't receive his healing, and um, he died from colon cancer. When Russell and I went to, on the morning of his funeral, when Russell and I arrived at the church, which was the church he was affiliated with, um, where they held his funeral, the, we couldn't understand what was going on because there was nowhere in the car park for us to park. And we ended up having to park quite far down the road. And um, there was standing room only. Um, and uh, it was just amazing. We couldn't believe why it was such a big funeral. And his funeral lasted such a long time because there were absolutely so many people who wanted to tell their story with my dad of how my dad had prayed for them and they'd received healing, how my dad had prayed for them and they'd been delivered from addictions, how my dad had led them to the Lord. It was absolutely overwhelming. I had no idea that how extensive my dad's ministry had been and how many people um, had been touched by the Lord Jesus Christ through my dad talking to them and praying for them. Um, it was absolutely overwhelming. So today I encourage you, be brave, speak to your loved ones about Jesus, lead them to the Lord. You never know where it will lead. Thank you. What a story that was. And as we hear the story that, that Karen tells and the impact that her dad had and how the, his funeral was full with the, the lives of, of people that had been am, impacted by the ministry of her dad. And that all started because at some point, Karen dealt with the person who was right in front of her. Without a consideration for all the things that might come from that, how would she even be, have been able to imagine that? But because she introduced her father to Jesus and because she dealt with a person who was right in front of in front of her, that part of his story, his legacy is also her legacy. So I wonder who might be in front of you that you can encourage. Paul planted this church on a second missionary journey. And in fact, it was the planting of this church has been recorded by um, the a traveling companion of Paul. His name was Luke. And he recorded the events that took place. And you can find it in Acts chapter 17. We won't read it now. You can go and have a read. It's the first 10 verses of Acts chapter 17. But I'll give you a summary of what took place. It starts off well. Paul goes and he preaches. And he preaches that Jesus was the Messiah. That he had to suffer. That he would be raised from the dead. And then it is recorded that some Jews and a large number of God-fearing Greeks believed. Then things turn a little sour. Uh, the, the, the Jewish leaders of the town get hold of um, some people that Luke describes as bad characters. One thing leads to another. A mob is formed. A riot happens. Jason gets arrested. And Paul has to leave town rather abruptly. So this all happened rather suddenly. And from what we have in the, the record that has been recorded to us uh, by Luke, has been recorded for us by Luke, we see that Paul actually didn't have that long in Thessalonica, quite short. In fact, the book of Acts said, tells us that he preached in the synagogue for three Sabbaths. Three Sabbaths, which means three weeks. And maybe you can extend it a little bit further. Maybe it was up to about four weeks, but it's barely any time at all. No time, not even, barely enough time to uh, call a church meeting. Barely enough time to do a refurbishment, say, in an auditorium. No church planter would say, give me three or four weeks and I'll have this all sorted. Some commentators think he might have been there a little bit longer, possibly up to three months. But whether it was three weeks or three months, it's not a long time to, uh, in order to plant a church. 
If it was three weeks, it's barely enough time to do a preaching series, I suppose, unless it was a three week series, but not much time at all. In fairness to Paul, he didn't know that things were going to go the way that they did. When he preached on his first Sabbath and second Sabbath and third Sabbath, I guess at that point he wouldn't have an idea of how things were going to head south rather quickly. Like I said, Thessalonica, Thessalonica was, a, um, was a key hub. And we know for us, coming out of COVID now, but we know that there was a time where borders were to the country were closed and city borders were closed and actually borders to homes were closed as well. But even though travel was restricted for us in Thessalonica at this time, completely the opposite. It was wide open and deliciously so. People could travel in from all parts of the world and back out again. Trade routes were good, borders were open, peace reigned, roads were easy to travel on, all was well. So in that case, in, in that way, sure, it was a great place for a church to be planted. And Paul reminds us as he writes to the church um, in Galatia, he says, Be very careful then how you live, not as unwise but as wise, making the most of every opportunity because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. It's inter interesting to consider what can be achieved, even if we don't know what it might lead to. I don't imagine when Paul started that he thought, I've only got three Sabbaths worth of preaching here, and then I'm going to be out of town. Paul was doing just what he did. As we read that sort of the, the, the central part of that little text that we've just read, where he says this, make the most of every opportunity. Now, providing a little bit of context, Paul was on a missionary journey. Paul was wanting to plant churches. Paul was empowered by the Spirit of God to do what he was doing. And it would be fair to say that, Paul, we are not. And yet, at the same time, we can still have the same attitude that Paul had in wanting to make the most of every opportunity. It's such a powerful, simple, and at times terribly scary thought. It's a wonderful outlook to have, and we just need to harness every opportunity as best as we can. So we work with children and we work with young people and we work with older people. Uh, and so we, we bake cakes for morning teas to be had at local schools. And thank you everyone that provided. I was there. It was a wonderful tea and well appreciated by the staff of the school. And our 24-7 team did a wonderful job in that as well. We fund things. We try to make the most of every opportunity. And so for each one of us, whether it is inside a planned event or it is outside of a planned event, we can um, make it our aim to make the most of the opportunities that we've been given. Of course, this work in Thessalonica is going to come under pressure, and we see this battle ensue in this place. No sooner have people responded to the gospel of Jesus than this pressure comes. And when I say pressure, I'm, I might be understating it a little bit. You see, there's a mob and there's a riot and then Jason gets arrested and has to post bail and Paul has to leave rather abruptly and he has to leave this new church in less than ideal circumstances. A little while ago at our dinner table, we were talking and Caitlin told us, and I don't know if this was a thought original to her, but she told me, I want to credit her with it. She can fix that up uh, with you later if you want to know where she got it from. She says that there's two kinds of people. There are orchids and there are dandelions. And neither is right or wrong, it's just different types of people. Orchids need a very specific set of circumstances in order to thrive. The right amount of water, the right amount of sun, the right position in a room. Anything just off and they, they really struggle to survive. Too much sun or too little or too hot or too cold or too much water or too little water and they don't thrive. Other people, however, are a little bit more like dandelions. All they need is a crack in a pavement somewhere and they're away and they are thriving. They grow and thrive, it seems to be anywhere. Neither is right or wrong, as I say, it's just the way certain people are wired. And it can be true of churches, except for the fact that in truth, as a church, we will never face orchid-like conditions. In fact, even if I was to ask you to create conditions that you think would be perfect for a local church to thrive in, what conditions would you have? Would you, um, what would you include or exclude? Would there be any persecution? If there is persecution, how much do you think would be the ideal amount? Or would it be completely peaceful? Would there be special 
a well-paid civil servant jobs for those who would call themselves Christians? Or would they be kept from the workforce? Would there be some sort of financial incentive to claim to be a follower of Jesus or would there not? Would you want the church to be wealthy or would you prefer it to be poor? Would you want a hostile press or a friendly one? What set of circumstances would you have that you think a church would thrive in? And here's the trouble. Even if one of us could come up with a, a set of circumstances that we think would be ideal, the moment we brought it into a group, I'm pretty sure we wouldn't agree on what that might be. And the reality is that churches don't get ideal circumstances. And this church in Thessalonica was no different. In fact, their circumstances were quite harsh. You see, a city like this one had a plural plurality of gods and an industry had grown up alongside it. Social networks take place within that and that makes sense. Yet there was this group of people that were starting to live in a new way. They had done so only briefly at this point, but there were some who it seems could look into the future and think, actually, this is not going to end well for us and our little patch. And they could see that synagogues might be empty, that employment would be under threat, that pagan temples would have um, cobwebs. And so they decide to nip this one in the bud. And so a, a, a mob is formed and Paul is run out of town. So then this church that had all of three weeks of planting has to figure out how to survive in the midst of persecution. But how much persecution were they having to go through? Well, we have a clue in our text, and then we have a, a better indication in the next chapter, and we'll have a look at that. Paul says that they welcome the message in the midst of severe suffering. Now, we know severe could be a relative term. We've all know people that, that feel things in particular ways. You've got some people who never have a cold, but always have the flu, never a headache, always a migraine. Whatever they have, it's the worst one ever. But chapter two gives us a clue as to the severity of the persecution that this church was facing. Paul says this, you suffered from your own people the same things those churches suffered from the Jews who killed the Lord Jesus and the prophets and also drove us out. Now, we know how Paul was treated. We see how he was treated here, but in other places, how people tried to kill him. In one place, they, they tried to stone him to death. That's how Paul was treated. But how were the followers of Jesus, other than Paul, um, treated? Well, in Acts chapter 5, they arrest all the apostles. They put them in jail. They do get let out by an angel in the night. And the religious leaders are mad. They are furious that this has taken place, and they want them killed. They get spoken down off that ledge and they decided not to kill them. They're given a, a severe talking to, but also they give them a 40 lashes minus one. So whoever was on duty that day, no doubt had a sore arm as they had to get through all of these people. And so this church at Thessalonica was facing a similar level of, um, of, of persecution severity. So it was quite bad. If anything, I'd say not ideal church planting, uh, a church planting environment, a severe persecution. And all they've had is three Sabbaths preaching from Paul. Yet this is a dandelion church. They've understood the message and they've welcomed it with joy. And this joy um, was not a human creation, but a Holy Spirit inspired joy, even in the midst of this persecution. It's easy to fall into a way of thinking that in order for me to grow as a disciple, in order for our church to, to grow and thrive in the community that it finds itself in, that we need a particular set of circumstances, that the music has to be just so, the preaching has to be just right, the people have to have just the right level of encouragement, or whatever our list might include. And yet we see so often that we don't get to choose our circumstances, that wherever we are, in whatever environment we find ourselves in, even like this church at Thessalonica that was facing severe persecution, we can still thrive as a church. You see, this church had a society that was actively, physically, socially, financially, and religiously against them. And yet we see in what they are doing that, that the, their faith that they have is being spoken of by churches around the region. Paul says to them, comments on their work produced by faith, your labor 
prompted by love and your endurance inspired by hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. Work, labor and endurance are the verbs that Paul uses. At the very least, it suggests toil, effort and some consistency in it. And this was a responsibility that they were taking as individuals, as a local church. But they did this work, this labor and this endurance was as a result of their faith, their love and their hope. It was inspired by their faith in, their love for and their hope in what Jesus has promised to them. They know that regardless of what they experience from around and about, that there is nothing that would be too much that would make be would, that would um, make being a disciple of Jesus not worthwhile. One of the features of this book that Paul writes, or this letter that Paul writes to this church, is at the end of every chapter, there is a look not only to the here and now, but what is to come. This book, and more so the second letter to the the the, the second letter to the church at Thessalonica, answers questions about things that are going to happen. And so this church seems to have the ability, even if not the complete understanding, to recognize that everything that they see, hear, feel, experience now is not everything. That there is something that is going to happen in the hereafter. In that way, they are like what was recorded about Moses in the book of Hebrews when it says that he um, regarded faith for the sake of Christ as of greater value than the treasures of Egypt. This ability of Moses to look forward and to see what was coming. Or perhaps we could take this, um, this well-known definition of faith also found in the book of Hebrews. Now faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. Our journey is not one that begins and ends here. Sure, it begins here, but it continues on and so do we. And our struggles, our pains, our heartaches are part of that journey. Our questions, our fears and failures are part of that journey. Our hope, our love, our service and our victories are part of that journey. Our, our joys and our happiness are part of that journey. But so too is our call to persevere through what we have to press on to what we are called to. Also part of our journey. So what about us as a local church? Well, if I don't look too far ahead, but just a little bit further ahead from where we are now, I am hopeful about our next year and the years that are going to follow. We had a discussion at church um, a little, a few Sundays ago, uh, where we, I, I asked people about things that they would hope. If we were going to tell a story in two years' time, what story would we like to be able to tell and talk about? Some of the things that were mentioned were closer links between us and our early childhood center, and we're working on that. Someone said about planting two churches. Now, I don't know if we can plant two churches, but we've already been looking at one potential church plant that we might be able to partner with a group of people in China on. Uh, the leadership is busy looking at that, and hopefully we'll be able to bring some details to the church in the near future. Someone said that to have a, a church where our children and grandchildren will come to know Jesus or will return to Jesus. And we're working on that as well. We also had a thriving 24-7 work. We're working on that um, already now as well. And then someone came to me after the service and said, phase two of our building underway. We're not quite on that one yet, but it's something that we will hopefully be working towards. To that list, I want to add just a couple of small things that I, I've, I've asked to go into the church calendar for next year. And that these aren't big things, um, but it is part of our, our work and our perseverance in where we are. And here they are. One is Holiday Club. We ran it for a few years and then through building work and COVID, we couldn't run it. But by the time it finished, there were about 100 children coming to us a day, mostly from the community that surrounds us. And we'd like to do that again. An opportunity to, to tell a generation of people about Jesus, the Messiah. The other one is this, is church camp. I really love church camp. It's a, it's a chance for us to go away, we get to talk, we get to play, we get to worship, we get to eat together, and we do all of this in an unhurried fashion. And so those are just a couple of things that I'd like to add into the list that we hopefully will get onto next year as well. But the reality is that whatever circumstances are around us, the encouragement to us is the same as the encouragement that was to this fledgling church, that we will um, do our work produced by faith, our labor, 
prompted by love and our endurance inspired by the hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. Let's pray together. Father, those words from Paul are so true for us today, just as they were true for that church in Thessalonica all those years ago. And so, Father, we do pray for us as a church that you continue to take us and use us for your purposes. As we look back in our church history, we see a legacy of people that had a desire to make Jesus known, that they wanted to look around the community that we find ourselves in and to be salt and light. And so, Lord, we thank you that we are standing on the shoulders of those who have gone before and allow us to keep that torch going, that we'll continue to look out and to see the places where uh, where we can work, the opportunities that are before us, making the best of every moment that we have. We pray that for, for this generation and for the generations to come, that there'll be this continual witness here of Jesus, our Savior. We pray this in his name.